Yeah. 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 All right, so everyone, thank you for coming. This is, can everyone see this? Is that semi-legible at least? Yeah. This is the third section of my homeschool class called Contemporaneity, Building a Better White Supremacy. Um, thanks to Victoria for your tireless work and creative paper crafting for hosting. So to summarize the previous sessions, uh, at the first class in my garage, I discussed ideas from David Jocelyn, who argues that the contemporary positions marginal practitioners in a relation of debt to Euromodernism. And in the second class at the Cherry and Lucic House, uh, Ellie, thanks for hosting. Um, I discussed how performing marginality in relation to value is a kind of alternate way to enter into organization. And the example that I focused on in that class was the incursion of vernacular speech, like poetry, into press releases. And so for this session, we're going to start with some screening. First is a sound piece by Winslow LaRoche and some videos. Here's the list. Okay. So you can close your eyes for this this sound piece, or just keep them open, or whatever you want. This is serious. We can make you delirious. You should have a healthy fear of this. Cause to much of us is dangerous. So dangerous. We dangerous. My flip mode squad is dangerous. So dangerous. We dangerous. My whole entire unit is dangerous. I thought Busta would be the best way to get anyone's attention. I am using Google Translate for its voice option because I hate the sound of my own voice. Don't we all? Our actual voices are higher in pitch than it is in our heads. This is my first and only sound piece. That is a declaration for I never wanted to make a sound piece, but I am honored to be in the show with only black artists for once. It is okay. Sound pieces are in right now, so this whole piece is on trend. It is marketable. That Y2K buzzworthy BuzzFeed quiz vibe. That John Cage jerking off vibe. That Carl Andre murdered Anna Mandita and wasn't held accountable vibe. That Salmud is a piece of shit vibe. That modernism was built off imperialism and genocide vibe. People want me to teach for free when I just want to make objects and smoke weed. People want to silence me and others who aren't afraid of criticality while victimizing their oppressive behaviors. I am not infallible, but I am alive. What I really wanted to put in show was a stuffed animal or a rag doll. Not on a nostalgia basis, because fuck that noise. It is about reclaiming that form from prolonged assimilation, fuck a Play-Doh perfect. Mike Kelly's Lily White Ass is not the only person who can use stuffed animals in their work when the origin of the doll is art started with black and indigenous hands. Not bloody white and western hands. We're not candy singing pills. This is serious, reads the 1980s ad. What would a singing pill have to say about medical apartheid? What would a singing pill have to say about Western painters vacationing on selling brown pallet domestics so they can visit islands made from cooling lava and warm souls? What would a singing pill say about Western painters seeing blue and pink painted buildings for the first time and co-opting it to make fauvism? What would a singing pill have to say about the under 15 year olds these white Western painters slept with? What would a singing pill have to say about the hair who co-opted in white watching Joe's wife Yoko's work? And pill have to say about us being rewarded within the art world from non-black people? How about just black people to other black people? Egypt, Kerma, Kush, Carthaginian, Blemies, Ptolemaic, Mauritania, Numidia, Mercuria, Nobatia, Vandals and Nalans, Punch the Mount Aksumite, Nak Ghana, South Civilization, the Bushmen. I don't want nobody fucking with me in these streets. 
I don't want nobody fucking with me in these streets. I don't want nobody fucking with me in these streets. Black women are the best. Present and future. Listen, ancestors are watching and having standards suck. Maybe people will start listening if they hear all this from a hauntingly white robot voice. Probably not because institutional critique is some bullshit that doesn't help the marginalized groups it discusses the most. It is an echo chamber policed by anti-blackness and fragile egos. The art world wouldn't let a black artist like Clementine Hunter or David Hammond thrive if they were young and making work now. If y'all gonna keep this system up, where da real patrons at? This is serious. We can make you delirious. You should have a healthy fear of us. Cause to much of us is dangerous, so dangerous we dangerous. My flip mode squad is dangerous. So dangerous we dangerous, my whole entire unit is dangerous. Special fun. Special Your eyes are still I love those. Trying to make a ladder? Lots of red eyes. Amen. More of urban water. Huh? Where is it? I just love to It's a present. Is it? Can we buy another? Yeah, thank you. Your entrance form. Special coin, special mountain. Your eyes match the walls. Final form. I like crying. Last word in interiors. More plants die of overwatering. Artists love sheet masks. Ace of Condoms. Raja. Lots of paradox this week. Misty eyes. Liar. My skin is very sensitive. But that's the cup. Numbered loosely. The confessions, writings, and poetry. Jealous my friend is about to die. No home is perfect. No family is perfect. Save some roots to text you later. Pentence is extremely tiring. Too fast. I went a lamp. Smoke is glue. Smoke is bee. Burning candy. Angry. Massive follower loss. Blossing with the rhythm. Or be plagiarized. It's been 10 years since 2014.
So this one is super long. Uh, whenever someone raises their hand, I'll skip forward. It's pretty special. I'll just give some context. Uh, she's a Finnish artist. She works in performance and digital media and she's practicing. She signed on with a company called Deloitte that does audits um, for financial and information security. And as a, a trainee for the job, she just doesn't work. But she's convinced her boss to let her do PhD training by just doing thought work. <laughs> so she, throughout this video, she makes people more and more uncomfortable. When they ask her what she's doing, she's like, oh, you know, thought work. <laughs> it's kind of in, in contrast to this, like, like when I slack off at work, it's very secretive, and I'm like alt tabbing between Facebook and work spreadsheets and stuff. She's not even using a computer; she's just sitting there, like, yeah, I don't. Know. It'll be a solid. Yeah, so this plane, like time lapse mode, <laughs> very long, very short piece. Thank <laughs> you. 
So you can read these emails, but someone is like emailing the boss that clandestinely allowed her to do this, and she's showing the emails out. I don't know if it really isn't implied, but she was yeah. just performing a refusal of work. Yeah, so. Like a cognitive yeah. context. Yeah, I think it's an interesting context for a thesis, too, though. Yeah. Think about it as like. Well, her thesis was about performance, as far as I know. Yeah. So it's really interesting to think of it in that sense. Yeah. Because it's so, like, mundane and it's like a months long yeah. secret project, you know? Uh, but it's also like an endurance thing because mm -hmm. it's like almost like after a certain point you're going to just want to do some work or something or like on facebook at least yeah. she just sat there in the yes the these moments are from after the work so uh -huh. she's like showing us the emails after the fact she kind of collected them as part of the documentation uh -huh. You can also raise your hand at any time. You want me to change it? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Ellie. Just some work by Zach Bless. Copying a bunch of text to write. copies a bunch of text to write. Mm -hmm. The idea is he's doing this whole contra internet thing. Part of his like campaign against corporatization of the web is like applying principles of open data to writing. Like plagiarizing. So there's the list. Oh wow, it is pretty bad. It's a little annoying. Oh well. Um, you have to do that. Yeah, we had a letter. I can, I can hold one in. No, it's fine. If everyone's okay with it being destroyed, because I'm going to read from it anyway. So. Okay, yeah. so, in this section, or this session, we'll talk about weaponized white femininity as one of the tools that the art market uses to reify its neo colonial anti black structure. The art world exploits the construct of the false universal woman and, in effect, couples white women. I'll we'll talk about this later as like a bargain that women make with whiteness to get social mobility, but in return, you don't get anything because whiteness only values women insofar as they move patriarchy with supremacy forward. It's like this idea of cupcake fascism, which is a cuter version of exclusionary fascist principles. That's subtle, like calling people of color racist for quote unquote bringing up race, and sometimes it's 
more subtle. Like when people say things like, quote unquote, Twitter encourages toxic discourse and everyone on there is a brand for it. I also uh, bring up this idea from right wing fascism called Apolitea. Uh, and it's a notion from mystic fascists like Joyce Evola and Ernst Younger. Um, Apolitea is the disavowal of earthly politics, which for these right wing thinkers frees man's actions from moral concern. Uh, and given that cupcake fascism is often gendered as feminine, I, I ask the question, I ask the question, what does cupcake fascist apolitea look like? Um, and I'm, I'm defining these things later, I'm just sort of giving an overview right now. And then I look at uh, the discourse of immaterial labor, both uh, its abandonment by the Italian post workers that termed it in the 90s, um, or it depends who you ask. I would say the ideas had been around since the 70s and 80s, but the term itself came about in 97. Uh, not only that, but also its absorption into a new art discourse since around 2008. Uh, and looking at this discourse might be useful. Uh, so here's a quote from a chapbook by Christopher Soto. And they say, I always wanted to be a sad white girl. I wanted to be like Lana Del Rey. I wanted a sadness so universal it had moved everyone to tears. A sadness everyone could relate to. Quote, I wanted summertime, summertime sadness, unquote. Yes, I've experienced that before. I know where that's coming from. Uh, and this is the cover of the chapbook. It's a text about, I guess, the limits of language to like activate politics. And they lie in the book about their experience, which is interesting. Um, it's a good book. It's pretty short, though. Uh, so a specter is haunting feminism, the specter of anti-blackness. And we see quotes here from some originary white feminist thinkers. Uh, some suffragettes. Elizabeth Caddick Stanton says, what will we and our daughters suffer if these degraded black men are allowed to have the rights that would make them even worse than our Saxon fathers? And Howard Shaw, who was a physician, Methodist minister, and president of the National Women's Suffrage Association said, you have put the ballot in the hands of your black men, thus making them political superiors of white women. Never before in the history of the world have men made former <laughs> This is so funny to me, sorry. That men have made former slaves the political masters of their former mistresses. And um, so it's interesting to me to think about that relationship. I don't have time to go into it here, but I just want to bring it up. And if you want to do research on it on your own, I think it's a good idea. The relationship between black men and white women in slavery and its afterlife. Uh, because she's really pointing at that when she says the former mistresses part. Uh, and just to remind people about context, this was when just as black people had gotten, black men specifically had gotten the right to vote, um, white women felt that it was like an unconscionable, um, an unconscionable thing to do to people that had a role in the white republic, because women made the labor power and created the people that were indoctrinated into whiteness. And so the vote was a way to get that. And Carrie Chapman Chat, who's the founder of the League of Women's Voters, makes it very clear when she says, white supremacy will be strengthened, not weakened by women's suffrage. And obviously white suffragettes could have argued the right to vote in a very different way, like fighting for black women's right to vote alongside their own. But the fact that many went the root of anti-blackness and weaponized their idea of the role of white women in the Republic reveals some of the assumptions of these early feminisms to which we are heirs. Uh, not that, you know, all suffragettes were anti-black, but it's a foundational part of the movement. That's just a fact. Um, and many of the leaders of the party, the parties that had sway were anti-black, as I just showed. And so feminism somewhat switched gears in the second wave to argue not that women and black people were different, but that there were comparable situations or strategic essentialisms that could be argued. Uh, and I just want to point out that this theoretical move completely erases black women. And you see that in things like <coughs> women and people of color, as if people of color take women. Um, and one example of this inheritance can be seen in Shulamith Firestone's foundational book, Dialectics of Sex, where she argues in chapter five that racism is an inverted form of sexism. And <laughs> they'll sweep to the rescue, as always. So I'm interested in asking the question in art and life, what is at stake when we argue for and reify whiteness's monopoly on femininity. 
And for anyone who was at Yun Song's talk at Duplex, she brought up a really good point about Duchamp's fountain specifically, uh, both in the moment that the piece was established and afterward when it became a collectible commodity um, through editions. She asked the question of what the fountain means when the bathrooms were for women, men, and color. So there wasn't even gender distinction for segregated bathrooms. And I recommend this text. So here's a long quote from Sylvia Winter. Uh, she's a Jamaican theorist. She writes about colonization and digitality, um, mythic structure and, and semiotics and stuff like that. And in an interview in 2007, she says, it's not that I'm against feminism. I'm just appalled at what it became. Originally, there was nothing wrong with my seeing myself as a feminist. I thought it was adding to how we were going to understand this world. If you think about the origins of the modern world, because gender was always there, how did we institute ourselves as humans? Why was gender a function of that? I'd just like to make a point here that is very important. Although I use the term race, and I have to use the term race, race itself is a function of something else, which is much closer to gender. Once you say, besides ontogeny, there's sociogeny, then there cannot be only one mode of sociogeny. There cannot be only one mode of being human. There are a multiplicity of modes. Um, sociogeny means something that emerges from social constructs and social, the society itself, where ontogeny is um, something emerging from a more essential place, platonic forms or whatever. <laughs> um, so I coined the word genre, or I adapted it, because genre and gender come from the same root. They mean kind, type. One of the meanings is kind. Uh, like a kind of thing. <laughs> now, what I'm suggesting is that gender has always been a function of the instituting of a kind. For example, in our order, which is a bourgeois order of kind, a bourgeois order of the human, the woman was supposed to be the housewife and the man supposed to be the breadwinner. Each was as locked into their roles by making the feminist movement into a bourgeois movement. What they've done, what feminists have done, is to fight to be equal breadwinners. This means that the breadwinning man and the breadwinning woman become a new class, so that the woman who remains in her role becomes a part of a subordinated class. I can find another quote that she had about the genres of womanhood, which I thought was really important, and she talked about imperial feminisms and um, the urge to correct non-white feminisms as this like role that white women take on, going into other countries and stuff. You all don't have to do that, seriously. Are you okay? Is it yeah. okay? Can you read it? Yeah, they're almost fine. <laughs> Am I speaking clearly? Yeah. 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 Okay. Cool. Because I, I can read it, so it's fine. Um, and so I go back to this distinction that Marx has between production and reproduction, um, which itself is a kind of heir to classical economic positions. Um, Adam Smith has this distinction between productive and unproductive labor. Here's a quote from him. The labor of a manufacturer adds generally to the value of the materials which he works upon, that of his own maintenance and of his master's profit. The labor of a menial servant, on the contrary, adds to the value of nothing. Right, yeah, so ridiculous. Um, and that's, I have a slide later, that's why it's so important that we acknowledge um, the campaign for realizing domestic work as labor and how that shows no, actually, it's not unproductive at all. So. Uh, Here's a quote from a University of Michigan study. Uh, in the United States, women spend about four hours a day on unpaid work, compared with about 2.5 hours for men. The difference starts early. American girls aged 10 to 17 spend two more hours than boys on chores each week, and boys are 15% more likely to be paid for doing chores. This statistic doesn't take into consideration rates, and women of color start doing that work a lot earlier, actually. Uh, control F. No results for black on the site, obviously. Post-war Italian workerism, autonomism, and materialist feminism were really crucial in arguing against this distinction. No, unproductive slash reproductive slash domestic slash care, and later, as I talk about, slash immaterial labor was actually and is actually incredibly productive and material to the maintenance and development of the capitalist order. But then I ask the question, has this dismantling of that binary actually happened yet. Um, and so, a little history on post-industrial feminism, particularly in Italy. On the heels of the second wave's forever unfinished debate regarding womanhood as inheritance or becoming, we see the wages for housework campaign from Italian materialist feminists like Selma James, Sylvia Federici, and Leopoldina Fortunati. 
The movement quickly quelled as across the post-industrial world, women entered the workforce en masse. White and wealthy women dropped the picket signs and hired generally black, brown, and poor women to do the previously unwaged domestic work, which the campaign shed light on as labor, as opposed to the natural lot of women. So this shedding light on it has kind of a dual, um, it's a double-edged sword kind of, because uh, you both acknowledge that it is labor, but then you also pay women in marginal positions really shitty wages to do it while you're in the breadwinning position, as Sylvia Winter points out. Uh, and just as a side note, I like to mourn this moment in uh, Leopoldina Fortunati's The Arcane of Reproduction uh, on page 98 and 99, where she tries to calculate the actual surplus value of unwaged reproductive work that women have done. I have a lot of issues with that. One of the main ones is that it doesn't take into consideration things like black women's slave labor. It's not the number itself. And in Wages Against Housework, Federici has a really good point that the actual number is irrelevant because it's supposed to be infinite. Like you can't fathom the amount of work that women have done and do to make the society possible. And so it's not the number, it's the position of thinking as thinking of that work as work, right? And not as the things that women are supposed to do, et cetera, right? It's, it's labor, it should be paid. Um, so that's something that really needs to be considered that it's not a number in itself. It's not a financialization of reproductive work. It's a position from which to dismantle that binary. Uh, and that's why she says, or she phrases it as wages against housework, not wages for housework. And that prepositional distinction is interesting to me. And so now switching to the idea of all of these things affecting art because the post-industrial um, exodus of women into the workforce affected art as well. Um, the politicization of women in art tends to happen mostly around representation and only recently has the tyranny of unwaged administrative and social labor seen mentioned, let alone critique. And to pick an example, in Australia, 75% of those who volunteer at artist run initiatives are women, according to Elvis Richard from Richardson from Countess, a blog that represents data that presents data and reviews on gender representation of the Australian workforce. So women are in and not making any money really in art. They're just sort of being used. Uh, whiteness controls the art market. So women entering it make the decision to invest in or divest from whiteness. And if we're to take the show Gallery Girls as an example of how this dynamic gets represented and enacted, these women are largely white. The circulation of art capital becomes a metaphor of whiteness that erases the neocoloniality and anti-blackness of art, a metaphor whose immaterial housekeeping, quote unquote, is done largely by precarized, often unwaged white women. Gallery girls. New York Times article? Oh, where did that go? I guess it's coming later. Uh, so this idea of reproducing whiteness, uh, for me, came out of uh, thinking about reproductive labor as on par with and indistinguishable from productive labor, which is one of, again, one of the great uh, revolutionary things about the Wages for Housework campaign. Um, and if we dismantle that shift and think about the production of whiteness, we can tie this into an idea from W.E.B. Du Bois from, I think, 1920-ish. Um, this idea of the psychological wages of whiteness. The white group of laborers, while they receive a low wage, or in this case, sometimes no wage, were compensated in part by a sort of public and psychological wage. They were given public deference and titles of courtesy because they were white. They were admitted freely with all classes of white people to public functions, public parks, and, public parks and the best schools. New York Times article. Since white women, white women are only really useful to white supremacist patriarchy as sex objects and house workers of white supremacy, it is clear to me that white women have let themselves be betrayed by white men. And a teleological Marxist might say that despite the significant social mobility, the entry into the post-industrial and cognitive workforce has given some white women and women of color, the realization of this betrayal is inevitable. I'm not a, I'm not a teleological Marxist, so I don't really know. But it is interesting to think about. Uh, and so now cupcake fascism. Exclusionary principles are meant to be presented in appealing packages. And cupcake fascism is this idea of quote unquote nice fascism that in the American context, for example, creates safe space for the reproduction and circulation of whiteness. And one case to consider 
could be the labor that usually white women do of making sure that none of the white people present feel the need to look around and take stock of whether and why the room is mostly white people. Another example of this kind of labor could be the impression management of mediocre white art that, to think back to my last class, performs exhaustion in relation to whiteness and value. This is an example of the term in the wild. And then a quote from Tom Wyman or something. I forget who wrote it. The radical possibility and cake. If we see the paradigmatic mechanisms of social oppression operative today in the form of a cupcake, then the clue to the overthrowing of these mechanisms exists also in cake, albeit of an entirely different kind. It is precisely in the truly cake-like, the spongy and the moist and the excessive and the unhealthy. Against the austerity of the cupcake form, we need to recapture in our social reality a sort of joy, the joy of being open to genuinely alternative possibilities. Another way of looking comes when we examine the way in which an infantilized adult is precisely not a child. And this has to do with his take on cupcake fascism where infantilization is an important part of it. Um, a child cannot remain a child. The child is on the way to becoming an adult. When a, child is, when a child does childlike things, it is in order to explore what the child will be as an individual. I can't even read this, it's like stuff like that. <laughs> uh, so the child is open to possibility and, all right, all right, and the child always has sticky fingers and jam around its lips and does things that no one would ever think are in its best interest. The infantilized adult, by contrast, because it is neurotically trying to remain a child, it, is, it cannot engage with the world in a way characterized by the joy of possibility. In order to actually live in the possibility of remaining a child, the world that the infantilized adult engages with must always remain safe and hold the uniform, the cupcake, as opposed to the messy and collapsing sponge cake. <laughs> Thus, if we want to become less infantilized, we have to behave more like children. If this seems like a paradox, it must mean that you are just not thinking about the matter dialectically enough. And I mean, the extension of the cupcake, that's fine, thank you. The cupcake metaphor like only goes so far and I'm not even invested in the cupcake as a metaphor, but more as like a discourse that can lead to things like this, which if anyone was in my last class, this kind of argument is exactly what Bifo was talking about when he says that poetry is this like revolutionary ironizing of labor that can lead to the dismantling of the neuroses of capital the neuroses of race. Um, I don't think irony can do that. Uh, yeah, I just don't think so. Yeah. But I do think that being childlike is important and is a way of dismantling infantilization. Mm. Abusing the safe space. Trigger warnings go too far when white people expect non-white people to censure white feelings when discussing racial oppression. This is a cupcake fascism which operates constantly and panoptically resulting in people of color, especially black women, doing constant emotional explanatory labor to navigate the strictures of polite white society. And so I want to turn now to this idea of apolitea, um, which I see as an example of cupcake fascism. Uh, and I've seen it in both white men and white women. And it's the disavowal of the political, the sort of supercilious look, supercilious affect toward the material. Uh, and I've heard this from people at all points, politically and aesthetically, you know, punky, white people, post-flower children, fashionistas, bond cores, Wiccans, and post-Marxists. Um, and so to think about this resonance between apoiteia and cupcake fascist disavowal, I have some quotes from some diehard fascists. Um, Julius Evola was an Italian fascist, and this is a quote from Ride the Tiger. He says, Apoliteia is the inner distance unassailable by society and its values. It does not accept being bound by anything spiritual or moral. Once this is firm, the activities that in others would presuppose such bounds can be exercised in a different spirit. Apoliteia or detachment does not necessarily involve specific consequences in the field of pure and simple activity, which is his way of saying he doesn't care about the consequences of the actions. Uh, I have already discussed the capacity to apply oneself to a given task for the love of the action in itself and in terms of an impersonal perfection. And then uh, the mystic Nazi officially cleared of any charges, Ernst Jünger, has a similar notion which he calls bald gang or a forest passage. And bald gang. Um, the individual achieves sovereignty by retreating back into the forest of interiority. 
And this ties into a kind of long history of German ecofascism and like uh, Blut und Borg, the idea that a German forest beats in the heart of every German breast. So the forest metaphor is not a new one, he didn't invite it. Um, but he did take an idea of Levin and made it about interiority. Um, it ties into this idea of the spiritual aristocrat that doesn't sully himself in materiality, um, sort of Gnostic position. And from the sovereign, indeed Machiavellian position, the individual can pursue, as Ebola articulates, a disinterested approach toward what modernity offers, despite lots of fascists and cupcake fascists rejecting the terms of modernity. Um, and Junger says on page 23 of The Vault Gang that if an enterprise is to be concealed from society, there is a proven method. You secrete it in some undertaking that society approves of, indeed regards as commendable. So thinking of like the psychological wages of whiteness, and also this idea from Charles Mills about the racial contract, that part of the social contract is uh, these racial divisions that, that go unspoken and that people reify. Um, one of the best ways to conceal that from polite society is to make it secreted into normal things, right? So one of the ways I think that that happens is through the market, right? The market logic of neoliberal capitalism serves as a metaphor to kind of erase uh, the actual anti-blackness that undergirds it. Um, and I brought up Nazis, so I should acknowledge that I got Godwin's law out of the way as quickly as possible. And Mark Godwin says that as an online discussion grows longer, the probability of a comparison involving Nazis or Hitler approaches one. <laughs> <laughs> so I tried to do it as fast as possible. Um, so now thinking about Cupcake Apoliteia, the retreat into interiority can be seen not only from mystic fascist approaches, or for that matter, consumerist approaches where because violence is displaced, it's out of sight, out of mind, um, or otherwise discussed in a framing involving representation or bourgeois values or respectability, etc. I'm trying to argue something deeper about cognition or let's say the cognitive slash affective economy and about what an artist is and does in a context like white America, which whether or not we're arguing has resemblance to Italian and German fascism, does deploy a politeia as a national pastime. Um, the logic of capital and of individual self-actualization to me is really drenched in a politeia's supremacy of the individual and of taste, a kind of like secularized hedonism. Uh, and the marketization of art and art education is partly a result of precarization. State funding doesn't really exist in the United States uh, and the art market doesn't get any of it. Um, and it only exists for and through universities in the context of the pedagogy industry. And as I said before, this marketization becomes a metaphor for whiteness, a plausible deniability. And the reason this has power is because truly neoliberals doesn't care about race at all and the flow of capital. Um, and black people can do it too. Uh, people of color can do it too. But coincidentally, neoliberalism enacts anti-blackness and neocoloniality and snares countries in uh, these debt cycles that they can never get out of. And as David Jostler argues, also kind of it snares marginal artists into this cycle of paying back debts to modernism aesthetically or trying to escape them somehow. Uh, and institutions such as art schools argue that they simply can't afford anything besides marketization. And some MFA statistics, you can't really see it, but these, <laughs> it's actually hilarious and poetic if you can't see it, but <laughs> these really tall, off gray ones are white people. Huh. So United States, mostly white MFA, 60%. Art school graduates, 80% white. Working artists, 77% white and working artists in school 80% in 2012 um, from the U.S. Census Bureau. And so now to think about immaterial labor. Um, among the recently prominent frameworks to discuss not only precarized art labor, but the work of the artist herself, immaterial labor stands out as one of the ones that is noteworthy to me. And this term was coined by Maurizio Lazzarato in 1997, but again, like I said, it's been thrown about and discussed in other ways for a long time. Um, but he coined it in 1997 explicitly to describe work such as what the Wages for Housework campaign shined a light on, which exists outside commodity production. The term was inspired by the post-industrial shift in Western nations to a cognitive economy, a moment coupled by the entrance of women into the workforce en masse. 
However, Lazzarato abandoned the term because it promoted a false dichotomy between material and immaterial, informational and industrial, productive and reproductive, etc. cetera. Uh, and this is especially true in light of cognitive production's rise to coveted economy status in the post-industrial economy. And, you know, a good example of that kind of cognitive uh, commodity would be like going to a concert or something. Or, you know, even being on Facebook. Uh, going further, I feel that the dichotomy falls in line with the productive, unproductive, slash productive, reproductive lineages we've discussed, which inhibits a true reorientation away from post-industrial neoliberal <laughs> understandings of work. And here's a long quote from that setup from 2007, or 2010, sorry. No sooner had we borrowed the concept than we were faced with ambiguities. People inter interpreted material and immaterial as opposites. There was, to them, immaterial work on the one hand, the work of artists or architects, for example, and traditional work on the other. We couldn't seem to escape this polarity between the two terms, and this was a constant source of confusion. The concept was intended to be political in nature, but was recast in a socioeconomic light. Which, and I think that says a lot about this assumption of potential radicalism in the academy. I think that did it a disservice. People started saying that such and such a worker was an immaterial worker, and such and such an industry was an immaterial industry. People applied the concept to the internet. This wasn't at all what I had intended. I wasn't interested in putting things into separate categories. So I abandoned the concept altogether and worked on subjectivity production instead. Fierce Patari argues that the crisis we have been witnessing for the last 40 years is not a political or economic crisis, but a crisis in the production of subjectivity, a crisis of subjectification. Now that I find interesting. From that angle, immaterial labor as a category doesn't make much sense. And what he means by that is that to produce subjectivity, all these different forms of labor and assemblages of post-industrial and industrial networks of production and circulation are part of it. You can't just say that one is material, one is immaterial. And even if you could, the distinction wouldn't really be helpful to describe how we end up in these neuroses of like buying into capital, buying into circulation and, and race and stuff like that. So one thing that I think about a lot is, why is the immaterial feminized? Or to ask this more precisely, why have economists, Marxists, artists, etc., drawn a link between cognitive labor and care labor that patriarchy genders and relegates to women? And I go back to ancient Greece, obviously. <laughs> Socrates describes the process of facilitating knowledge as elenchus or midwifery. Uh, in keeping with this, Marx's, Marx's examples when he describes the productive-reproductive distinction, aside from actual reproductive work, include the work of the teacher. In 2011 to 2012, 76% of public and 74% of private school teachers were women. 81% of the former were white, 88% of the latter were white. This is another government study. Here's this meme that I found that is interesting to think about. It says, beware male artists making work about emptiness. Nothing does not belong to you. Girls own the void. Back off, fuckers. We get this East Klein here, John Cage here. I don't know what these are. I guess just make sure. Um, some object in the corner. I'll do more research and find out what it is. And an important side note to take that meme very literally. Uh, we should be very explicit when we condemn racialized discipline in schools. Uh, if the stats are right, white women play a large role in this, which speaks to their history in relation to black and brown people and their role within white supremacist patriarchy. Psychological wages of whiteness, to go back to this. Teachers don't make much, including white women, but they have the ability to be stewards of whiteness, central aspects and fulcrums of its reproduction and circulation, perhaps unaware of whiteness betraying them as it kills people like me. So now to think of some examples that are uh, instructive. Um, Laurel Patak's 2014 project, Wages for Facebook, appropriated Sylvia Federici's 1975 text, Wages Against Housework. Uh, she replaced housework with Facebook in the text, as well as truncated it by, I think, two or three pages. Uh, when you go to wagesforfacebook.com, the text scrolls upward and the viewer is given no control over the pace. In its campaign for waging users' digital sociality on the corporate platform, and in its comparison of this activity to care work. The project serves to reify the digital divide and the erasure of displaced labor that subsidizes our online activity. Violent mining in Africa, deep sea fiber optic cable installation, server room maintenance, and main corporate admin labor, 
third world platforms and content moderators. And if you remember this article from 2014, the laborers who keep dick, dick pics and beheadings out of your Facebook feed. And this photo shows a contractor at the Manila office of Task Us, a firm that provides content moderation services to US tech companies. In this sense, the position of waging emotional labor is a double-edged sword. On the one hand, it can destabilize the production reproduction binary that oppresses women, in particular women of color. On the other hand, it can serve as a kind of where white feelings, which are gendered feminine under white supremacist capitalism, deserve not only their already bestowed psychological wages, but real wages against the cognitive and affective results of those psychological wages. So thinking here about like, what are the platforms that make feelings possible, right? Like in the production of subjectivity, how do we engage with our environment in a way that is reproducing these, I guess as Bifo would call them, neurotic ideas? And, and what is the work of the people around stewarding that subjectivity being produced? Uh, and the immaterial framework can thus reify white suffragette anti-blackness to erase black women and black and brown people generally, or by abandoning itself, by sort of hollowing out the assumption that it makes, can reconfigure the universality of the white invented category woman by shifting our understanding of what we think of as immaterial. And like I said, it's instead deeply material, so permeating that it can seem invisible. Another example. For an exhibition about the relation between women and sci-fi, Marissa Olson, inventor of the term post-internet, curated a show in Paris, including a piece by Alexander Demanovich which subsumed the story of Henry Adelax into a fantastical time travel narrative. And I'm going to show you a clip from an interview that she did. It's a sexist thing to say, but you have chosen women. Is that unconscious? It's very conscious. I very intentionally chose women. When I was beginning to think about planning this exhibition, I was actually just interested in the relationship between women and science fiction. And even though there are a number of great um, female sci-fi authors and filmmakers, they just don't often get the same platform that other male authors do. Um, and by the same token, the work that we are familiar with often treats female characters in not the best way. So they don't usually get to have as much fun in the movies. The boys have their toys and they get to do all the time traveling and the women kind of have to stay at home in those films and stories. Um, so then as I started developing the exhibition, I thought, I don't want to spend a lot of time harping on how women are being mistreated. I just want to give a platform to these 10 great women and let them talk about science fiction. So let's talk about one of their works. Sure. Makoto Hella. Yes. Tell us about it. Yeah, it's one of my favorite pieces in the exhibition. We're very lucky that Alexandra Jamanovich made a new project for us. And she does a lot of very research-based work. So she'll go online and do a lot of intensive research. And she'll often print out the information that she's gleaned onto these sheets of paper. In this particular piece, there are 8,000 pieces of paper. And you can see that at the very edge of the paper, images bleed out so that when they're stacked up, it actually creates an image on the side of this kind of monumental stack, even though you can't see what's on the surface. Um, and there are two stories being told in this piece. So the top half of the image is a scene from a Japanese anime film, a recent sci-fi film called The Girl Who Leapt Through Time. And as I said, women don't often get to time travel in sci-fi, but in this film, a young woman gets to time travel using technology that her mother invented to try to save her mother's life. Um, and then in the bottom half of the image, there's a story represented that seems like science fiction, but it's actually true. Uh, they're close-ups of what are called Hela cells, H-E-L-A. And technical. it's very technical. <laughs> I know it's hard to explain, but it's an amazing story. So um, there was a woman, an American woman, uh, who died in 1951 of ovarian cancer. And her doctors miraculously discovered that her cells were immortal. Most cells reproduce a few times, divide, and then die. This woman's cells live forever, and they've now reproduced them up to 20,000 tons worth. They were the first cells, um, human cells that were cloned. 
um, her cells were used to test the polio vaccine. Mm -hmm. um, so this woman, this real life woman, is kind of like a time traveler. She gets to live forever because her cells are being kept alive for you know, 50, 60 That's years. So the artist was very deeply influenced by this woman's life story. Um, and this piece, in a sense, becomes kind of a monument to her as well as a commentary on science fiction. Okay, that sounds all really good, right? So they're not talking about. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> okay. Henrietta Lacks's, Henrietta Lacks's bodily autonomy as a black woman was violated when she became the unwitting donor of cells from her cancerous cervical tumor. She died uncured in 1955, but George Otto Gray used the donated cells to create the first human immortal cell line, HeLa, which also not, also mentioned. And this is in line with other U.S. violations of the autonomy of black and brown bodies, like the Tuskegee experiment with unconsenting black syphilis infected subjects, surveillance starting in Philadelphia and expanding outward in the 70s in the black community, or forced and coerced sterilization of black and Latino women in California, as well as other examples. And as you just saw in the clip, this isn't mentioned in the work or Olson's framing of it in the clip. I don't think Olson even mentioned that she was black. She didn't even mention her name. She did, didn't she? Wow. Brutal. Yeah, right. So, crazy shit. <laughs> okay. Cupcake Wars. The end. <laughs> now we can talk if anyone wants to ask any questions. Hoping the internet doesn't crash. Oh, cool. Awesome. Okay. Does anyone have any questions? <laughs> I'm, kind of, I'm kind of wondering, like, especially about um, thinking about the videos that you screened in the beginning. Mm -hmm. if, um, well, I, I want to first state that what I show before my classes isn't related to the topic that I discussed, but I do welcome you finding connections. Oh, yeah. I just yeah. want to, because I don't want to overdetermine the work. Oops. Um, maybe it was. I'll be anymore. Yeah. Yeah, I follow for more soft grunge. Yeah. Um, if you don't want to be on screen, let me know. I'm mostly, I'm, I'm mostly asking about it because I think that um, there have been fruitful conversations uh, about like the white feminine form specifically within like digital work. Mm -hmm. And I think that also was present in your exhibition at Compliance Division with SNAP. Mm -hmm. And I'm kind of like, I would be interested, considering the fact that you were directly addressed immaterial labor here, and the like large like umbrella of immaterial labor that exists within like the within digital praxis mm -hmm. of of like digital based artists. If you could just maybe talk a little bit about uh, like the like especially maybe that video could be a case study, but the but the female white female body within that, like you said some good stuff about Kate Durbin's work. Mm -hmm. You talked about the existence of your own work, but also the work of the people from SNAP within well, the unsafe space of the internet. Right, and sort of healing techniques or something Yeah. as a response to that. Um, in terms of Rosemary's piece, there's lots of ways to read it. I think it's really good. Um, not just as a sort of like indictment of the tension economies that happen on Tumblr and, and glitch culture, but the way that the glitchiness is used as a metaphor for like applying, you know, Hitler Steyer's idea of like the circulation of the poor image, mm -hmm. where that poor image is like a white woman squashed into being a coveted commodity, right? And circulated as this like symbol of imperial success or something, or, you know, being advertised as the product of why you would go somewhere, why you would join a site, why you would have goals and dreams and whatever, right? Mm -hmm. So that I think the video is really useful for that in terms of trying to relate it to what I'm thinking about. Um, in terms of the snap stuff, I'm going to answer it in a way that doesn't relate to Rosemary's piece. Um, in case people missed it, it was an exhibition of um, mostly black artists, except for Toria, Adam, and Porpentine, um, who were res kind of responding to this the exploitation of hypervisibility of blackness online, which is in a long lineage from jazz, right? Where 
jazz got exported to Europe as the symbol of American imperialism and, and cosmopolitanism. Black people didn't see much as a result of that, right? Um, and then thinking about this newer form of it where going online as a person of color and also as a woman, and also especially as a woman of color, the passport is violence. Like you're harassed at every turn. That's just what it is to be online, right? And there are healing mechanisms that people come up with that I wanted to think about and showcase as um, originally in response to how white ASMR is, specifically that was like the starting point. Um, ASMR is this like <laughs> pseudo eroticized um, textural exploration, like people will film themselves crinkling gum wrappers or, or talking really quietly or eating foods, very specific foods, and it um, it's auto sensory meridial response, and it's supposed to create some sort of semi erotic buzz, um, but it's a very white dominated thing, and then. I started thinking about that and reaching out to people like Elizabeth and Putu and Devin Kenny, uh, Hamishi Farah, et cetera, and asking them to contribute work that would respond to this like over-determination of online embodiment, like how white it was, I guess, and how people don't talk about harassment, like ways of avoiding it or, or healing from it or something, right? And Liz's video was the first one that I gravitated toward, and it ended up anchoring the other stuff. Her video was like five elemental cyber breaths, five different tactics for dealing with being online as a woman, especially a black woman. Yeah. No, that's a helpful answer. Okay. Anyone else? <laughs> ah. Let me show you. What do you do? Oh, the bathroom, yeah. All right, so I'm going to stop streaming. I'm done. Thanks. Thanks, Thanks, Thank you. Thank you all for coming. Thanks, Internet. Mm -hmm. uh...